Welcome to Mastering Herbalism with Bob Lindy of the Tradition School of Herbal Studies in sunny St. Petersburg, Florida. This podcast raises the bar for everyone, whether you're a novice all the way through practitioner. If you have an interest and excitement for herbalism, you can join us to explore the exciting world of herbal medicine. Today's episode is all about how to use herbs safely for your health. You know, so often I have people come into the clinic and they ask if this herb cures cancer, if this is good for diabetes, and they never really have the conversation about where do you get your herbs from? Are these safe with my medications? And so many other things. In this day and age, we're getting so much of our health information off of a few second TikTok video. Literally, I have to watch TikTok just so I can see what's popular this week. So I have to say that one of my favorite people, uh, he's an herbalist, a friend, a teacher, David Winston, he once said this to me, actually he said it in front of a class, that in his lifetime, herbs have really become popular, but not herbalists, and that's part of the problem. So today we're going to work on a little bit of how do we find a good herbalist if we're trying to take care of our own health care. Well, then we'll see how to ensure that the herbs that we're taking are safe. So as we journey together th discussing these ideas of safe herbalism, I want to pause a little ways through and look at some of the questions that oftentimes I've not answered as we do our monthly Facebook Live, uh, the Herbalist Open Forum. So just trying to mix it up a little bit so I don't talk too much of the sciencey stuff. And, you know, if you've got an herbal question or a health question that you'd like to have me cover on a future episode, you can go ahead and email the school, the podcast at traditionsherbschool at gmail.com. And we'll be sure to talk about it in one of our future episodes. And of course, if there's a guest you'd like us to feature on the show, have them reach out to us and contact us. And of course, no herbal podcast is complete until we've given a little bit of a disclaimer. So please consult your herbalist, naturopathic physician, medical doctor, acupuncture physician, or some other interesting set of letters for your personal health journey. And nothing I say is approved by any federal, state, or local government agency and does not constitute medical advice. But your great-grandmama probably would approve of a lot of what I talk about. So as we're exploring using herbs and, and as we see it becomes literally now it's a multi-billion dollar industry, we see it on Instagram, podcasts, there's TV shows, you name it. There's so much information coming out about herbalism. There's a million different books, everybody giving you advice about this replaces this medication or this drug. And as somebody who's been practicing for the better part of my entire life, formal clinical practice for over 25 years, it's not that easy. There's so many times when we do need medications that we can use herbs to supplement them. We can change our behaviors and use herbs as we slowly dose off of our medications. But the reality, that's not something that's easily done on our own. So one of the questions I always like to educate people about is, so I want to use herbs. I want to take supplements. I want to use more natural means to address my complex chronic health disorders. And that's a great place to come to in your life where I'm going to make some changes. So the most important thing to do is find somebody to work with, somebody to help guide you through this process. And ultimately, I think that should be an herbalist. Uh, herbalists are unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your point of view, are not a defined entity. That's not something that's controlled by a state license or some kind of board that oversees us. So poof, all of you are listening to this wonderful podcast. So you're now a master herbalist because that's really a made up term. You know, in, in a lot of professions to be considered a master at your craft means 10,000 hours of uh, work in that profession. And you can go online and in one weekend in about 50 bucks, you can get a certificate that says you're a master herbalist. So I think it's important that we work with somebody that has gone through some sort of more extensive training. Uh, and we do have some guidelines for that. The American Herbalist Guild, uh, which you can find online, is our professional organization for herbalists. And they set up some fairly specific criteria as to how somebody should be educated to become an herbalist. 
And it's one of those things that there are certain subject matters that you should cover. Um, ideally, some clinical practice, some basic anatomy and physiology, some pathology, so they really know what they're talking about when you confront them with their medical diagnosis that you may have gotten from an MD. One of the things I always uh, tell people to think about, there's different approaches to herbalism and there's no single pathway to becoming an herbalist. So you can go to a formal school like Traditions School of Herbal Studies. You can apprentice with somebody like your grandmother. You can literally travel to another country into the jungle and spend 13 years with a shaman to learn every aspect of some of the medicine. Honestly, I started out with self-study before I knew you could run away and become an herbalist. Um, so a lot of my training was literally just getting every book I could find, trying to learn the local plants and how those could be utilized to help myself. Um, and as time went on, to help other people with it as well. So I would say as you investigate any kind of herbalist, ask them how they got to where they are. Um, what was their training? What's their experience? And one of the most important things to ask them is, how do you evaluate me as an individual to see what herbs are going to be appropriate? And there's many ways. We can use traditional Chinese medicine uh, that has a long history, Ayurvedic medicine. There's other traditional cultural approaches. We can do medical herbalism where we look at blood work, where we um, need a medical diagnosis to approach those issues. Um, and there's other folks who are intuitive herbalists, which is a little bit more of a stretch, but sometimes very valid in its approach. Other people just have protocols that they use. My preference is to use a mix of both medical herbalism, blood work has information that's helpful, along with some traditional cultural construct. And that's a big deal, looking at a history of helping people. All of us have gotten here somehow. So for tens of thousands of years, humans and animals for that matter, have used herbalism to help especially their chronic conditions. But in reality, even acute issues like colds and flu or injuries, traumatology kind of issues. But sometimes, you know, people sit there and they'll really tear down the medical institutions. And, um, and I'm going to quote David Winston again. He always talks about the dominant medicine, just like um, you know, Native American cultures were the first culture here. Now the European culture is the dominant culture. So right now, Western medicine is the dominant medicine. If you go back two, 300 years, herbal medicine was the dominant medicine. And we're finding that we're finding a balance as we go forward. We're finding that there's benefits to herbal medicine. But that doesn't mean we should throw out Western medicine. Western medicine, their tests, their blood work, their imaging, um, the science behind it has real value. In particular, an area of medicine that I call heroic medicine. If you get hit by a truck, an herbalist is not the person you want. You want the paramedics to take you to the emergency room and get all of the help that they have to provide. Once you're stabilized, then going to see an herbalist of some sort um, to help you speed your recovery, to minimize your side effects from some of that more aggressive care. The idea that they can replace your heart is truly a miracle and one of the amazing things that science provides. So if you've gone to the American Herbalist Guild and you've looked for one of the registered herbalists or you found somebody in your community, a lot of times going to your local health food store, there's even really great herbalists who work online if you don't have an herbalist in your community. But Usually getting a referral from somebody is one of the best ways to find an herbalist. I always say that the term master herbalist or herbalist or healer, so many different languages that we use to describe a person who uses herbs to help someone is not so much the moniker that they give themselves, but when their community recognizes them as someone who reaches out and helps people to create balance, to restore their health. So look for that person in your community who is got that gift to help people find the changes that are necessary in their life. And ultimately, you know, we've probably all been guilty of using supplements or herbs to um, allow for our bad behavior. You know, if you enjoy a cup of coffee that allows you to stay up a little bit later or do a little extra on your day off and do a podcast, um, that, you know, we use caffeine from a plant that is a stimulant. And so it allows for our bad behavior, pushing a little bit harder, working a little later, 
Um, so herbs can be used inappropriately. Uh, we use bitter melon to help us so we can have some cake and uh, our blood sugar is not in control. We have to be careful that we don't use that to cheat necessarily. Um, so working with an herbalist will also help you change your behaviors, your lifestyle, as herbs start to take over a bigger role. And ultimately, um, if you start to address it soon enough, herbs can um, make it so that we don't need the herbs anymore. So just your lifestyle is your primary means of maintaining your health. So that's a big part. So one of the things that often comes up is which herbs do I get? There's so many different companies. There's supplements in pill form. Now there's herbal gummies, which I never recommend. Um, there are teas and decoctions and tinctures, which are alcohol extractions. There's different types. We talk about this one's double extracted. This one's concentrated. How do I know that I'm getting the good quality herbs that will actually provide benefit? And I'll give you a, a really good example uh, of why quality control with your herbs is so important. I recently, you know, we, uh, we have over 800 herbs at, at the clinic, and it's hard to source good quality herbs at that many, both Chinese, Western, Ayurvedic. And um, one of the ones that's been hard to source in the last two months is Bacopa Mononeri. This is an Ayurvedic herb that's used for memory. It's also used for stress and focus. Really a great herb for ADHD. Um, and it tastes kind of nasty. Luckily, it grows wild here, but I usually grow it more to know the plant rather than to harvest the ones that I grow. So all of our usual sources uh, had dried up, so we were looking for another source. And we actually found a company that was uh, in Tampa. So it was like, oh, this is close by. Nice to, you know, minimize the uh, amount of travel that the plants had to go and nice to support a local company. And we probably didn't do the, the usual deep dive. We were like, no, we really need some Bacopa. And uh, we got it. And I was like, you know, anytime we get a new company that I haven't worked with before, I need to check it out. And, you know, some of the things that we talk about that's ideal doesn't always happen. So it didn't have my certificate of analysis that I'll explain in a moment. And so I took it and I looked at it and I was like, all right, there's a few odd things in here. And so I took a handful of it and I put it in some hot water to rehydrate these dried herbs. And um, I started to examine it as it was hydrated over the space of a few hours. And I noticed that the stem was square which usually is a plant in the mint family, which Bacopa is not in the mint family. And uh, it was, uh, it should be a round stem. So I was like, all right, little red flag. And it has a very small leaf uh, that's fairly bitter, uh, bitter and acrid. And I drank a little bit of the tea. It was actually quite pleasant. It wasn't bitter at all. And so I pulled out a few leaves and I started to uh, lay them out on a table. And they were this very thin, thin, wide leaf that I couldn't identify that wasn't Bacopa. So we had bought a kilo of this herb and we have no idea what it was. And if I hadn't done the due diligence of double checking the quality control that they even gave us the right plant, who knows what I would have put in uh, all of our clients uh, formulas. So needless to say that became compost. Uh, and, and it's one of those things where we have to make sure that we're getting our stuff from a reputable company. And ideally, uh, at least at my level where I'm uh, selling retail kind of things, that retailer better make sure that they're getting the right plant uh, and that it's good quality. So there's a couple of different ways that we get plants. We can wild har harvest where it's literally coming from the wild. Um, we can have things that are grown specific where there might be a a half acre or so of echinacea or, you know, acres and acres of ginseng. Um, ideally, we're going to source things that are organic. But if you're wild harvesting, that's not certified organic. So if people are wild harvesting, we have to assume that the wild harvester is a good botanist, that they can identify the plants uh, appropriately. And there has been way too many examples over the years, about every 10 years or something, 
there's a recall of an herb where somebody was not a good botanist and they went out and harvested hundreds of pounds of what they thought was the right herb. One good example is there was a, in the 70s, there was an herbalist thought they were harvesting plantain, um, Plantago officinalis, or excuse me, Plantago major, um, but they got germander, a toxic herb. And we had a bunch of people with elevated liver enzymes and liver failure. Um, luckily, that was caught before it got out on too wide of a distribution, but it raised a bunch of red flags about the safety of that. You also have wild harvesters that are not going deep enough into the woods, and so it's too close to a roadway or a factory or in a drainage ditch that is full of pollutants. So knowing that either the wild harvester is very good or the company they're selling to is doing good testing. And the gold standard of testing, besides just looking at it and saying, hmm, that looks like the herb, uh, one of the things that is ideal is that they do an evaluation looking for heavy metals, pesticides, and marker compounds that identify and ensure that that plant is true, uh, that it's the plant that we say it is. One of the tests that we look at is a uh, chromatography. So that's one of those fancy things where we, we send it through a computer and it gives all of these peaks and valleys and it says, oh, this matches the exact pattern that we expect to see with something like St. John's wort. And so it guarantees that we have the right plant. Um, although that's not perfect, it, it is at least that we're working with the correct plant and it has a marker compound in it that we want. A certificate of analysis may have chromatography in there, but also they're looking at those pesticides, heavy metals, yeast, mold, fungus, E. coli. Um, and even at our retail level, because we work with raw herbs, we think it's important to send it out to independent labs uh, periodically to check any of the companies that we're working with. And so that's the other part we look at. Are those tests, the certificate of analysis for heavy metals and pesticides done in-house with a company, which for many of the larger companies they have to do, but ideally that it's sent out to a third party that's not associated with it. I also like seeing the herbs come from either United States, uh, Canada, uh, or Europe. Those tend to have the highest standards, um, but some plants don't grow in those regions. So we're getting them from South America or China or wherever. And, and it's funny, one of the things that uh, I, I always teach my students is a really fancy sounding thing, organoleptic testing. That sounds really intense, but the reality is organoleptic testing is smell it, taste it, touch it, look at it. And a lot of people would recognize a good mint. So you're like, oh, I see these little crinkly leaves. You notice the square stem and the scalloped edge to the leaf, and you give it a rub, and you're like, wow, that's a really intense smell of mint coming across that leaf. And if you made a cup of tea out of it, it would have that slight darkening of the tea, but ultimately those volatile oils would come up from the cup and you'd be like, oh, I can't wait. This is going to help my digestion. We can use it for colds and flu as a diaphoretic, something that makes you break a sweat. And the reality is something could be really old and it's sold as mint and it is mint. So it comes out on the chromatography and the uh, certificate of analysis but it doesn't have that freshness. It doesn't have those volatile oils that can literally evaporate with time and exposure to air. So all the fancy tests in the world, trust in your nose, trust in your eyes, knowing what those colors are, and that's experience with herbs. So as you explore herbal medicine on your own, as you buy herbs, as you grow herbs, recognizing what does that look like? What does it smell like? When you taste it, is it bitter? Is it sour? Is it acrid, like tingly in your mouth? Does it give you a particular emotion? And then if you have it fresh, where you know exactly how it was grown, when you buy an herb, when you start working with larger amounts, when you're selling them or preparing formulas for a client, then you can sit there each batch that comes in, you take just a moment to see if it still has that tingle, that taste, that smell, making a cup of tea and taking a sip. And there's always variation. That is the nature of natural products. Depending on the season, how long it's been in storage, how it was dried, will determine the quality. And you may have to change your dosage of some of your formulas for that. One more word of caution on that. Um, we had a gentleman, wild crafter, 
brought us in um, a gift. He, he was from Alabama, nice guy, and he had potted up what he said was go-to cola, Centella Asiatica, which is a wonderful herb. I use it tons of times. I so often use uh, go-to cola. It's in Ayurvedic medicine. It's in Chinese herbal medicine. Lots and lots of Western herbalists use it. Um, I use it. It's my go-to for autism, uh, autism spectrum, but especially the nonverbal. Um, it's great for connective tissue disorders. And then most people know it uh, specifically for memory. Uh, and I really like it for that. So my uh, staff was so excited. They had these plants and they were like, look what somebody brought us. And he said that we can buy more and he would wild harvest it and dry some. And I, I looked at it and it was loosely shaped like it, but it was way larger leaf than I'd ever seen on go-to cola. And the stem wasn't quite right. And the stem attachment at the leaf wasn't quite right. And um, I looked at it for a minute and was like, I'm pretty sure this isn't go-to cola. And I took a little nibble of it because I was suspecting what it was. And I, I always say I'm a good herbalist. I'm not a great botanist, but I know my botany pretty well. And um, it had this really hot, acrid uh, flavor to it. And go-to cola, I think, is great in a salad. You can make pesto out of it. So go-to cola is pretty nice tasting. And I was like, you know what? This isn't go-to cola. This is something called wild ginger, which has a toxicity to it. Uh, it has aristolochic uh, alkaloids in it that can cause liver damage and would be contraindicated for a wide range of people. And although it's used uh, medicinally, usually topically, um, usually if you're going to use it internally, there has to be a little bit of processing or a lab test done to ensure that it's not affecting you adversely. And this guy has been selling these all over the Southeast as go-to cola. And it's kind of scary if you don't know a little botany, if you didn't taste it, if you've never tried go-to cola uh, before. So really important that we pay attention to, to all of this. So um, I want to get a little bit into herb-drug interactions because I think that's something that's not talked about enough. Um, and I know that when I was in acupuncture school, uh, and I was a Western herbalist first, and then I ran away to acupuncture school at some point, really solidified it, and pursue using both Chinese herbal medicine and Western herbal medicine in my practice with a smattering of tropical medicine. I'll talk more about my lineage in a minute. Um, but too often we're not having that conversation. People are taking herbs and drugs for the same cause. And that has a little bit of concern and higher risk of having an adverse event. And, you know, we always appreciate that there is a uh, you know, folks who allow for uh, podcasts to happen. And I wanted to take a quick break and uh, look at one of our sponsors for uh, this episode. And this episode is brought to you by Acupuncture and Herbal Therapies, one of the oldest and most experienced clinics here in Tampa Bay, Florida. We should have called it the Clinic of Last Resort because that tends to be who we see more often than uh, people coming in for just really boring stuff. It, one of the things I've always joked about with the clinic is we have success where all the others fail. Whether it's another acupuncturist, whether it's MDs, the Mayo Clinic, those tend to be the clients that we see there. Um, we've got a great staff there. So call today to schedule your appointment with one of the amazing practitioners. Come by and check out the over 800 Western and Chinese herbs we have in the apothecary, the medicinal herb garden out back. And remember, there's a reduced rate intern clinic there. So you can find out more at ACU. H-E-R-B-A-L-S dot com, AccuHerbals.com, or call 727-551-0857. So let's get into herb-drug interactions. You can really go down into the science of this pretty intensely, and it can get a little overwhelming. I, I was once teaching a class on uh, herb-drug interactions because it's kind of one of my passions to make sure that uh, we don't have those adverse events. I want people to know how safe herbs are. But the reality, herb drug uh, interactions do happen. And I was teaching this class and somebody said that there was a bunch of new graduates from the local pharmacy school coming. And I was terrified. I was like, I am definitely not uh, a pharmacist and I won't say that I know enough. Uh, you know, I'm pretty good with anatomy and physiology and pathology. But when we start talking about, you know, the, the pathways of processing it, the P450, like I can say those words, but I'm not that good. And so 
there was like six pharmacy graduate, new graduates in there. And I was like, these guys are going to just sharpshoot me and kill me. And I was like, I apologize. I am not going to be able to speak pharmacology at your level. Um, I, I know enough to say P450 and so forth. And they're like, don't worry, we don't understand that junk either, which made me feel better, but also was a little scary. So one of the things, rather than memorizing every prescription medication, trying to... Uh, Think about this intense isolation of these chemicals and how they're processed through the body. Um, where you know we do have to think about excretion and absorption through the bowels and the stomach and how it's excreted through the kidneys and, and through the poop. But one of the biggest things I encourage people to look at: if you're taking an herb and a drug for the same purpose, there is a risk because the herbs do stuff; they work. That there's a risk that you're going to enhance the effectiveness of the medication, which can cause a problem. So blood sugar is a great example. If you're taking something like metformin and it's doing a good job in controlling your blood sugar, you're starting to increase your activity level to burn up the sugar that you do eat, you're reducing the amount of sugar and refined carbohydrates in your diet to start bringing that A1C and that fasting glucose down to a more appropriate level. And then all of a sudden you heard on TikTok that, oh my God, there's this wonderful herb that grows all over the tropics, especially here in Florida. You can find it in the Asian market. It's called bitter melon. And you're like, it's good for blood sugar. It lowers blood sugar. So you start taking that. It will literally drop your blood sugar dramatically too low, which is just as dangerous as the high blood, pressure, uh, blood sugar. So it's important that we monitor how an herb or a supplement we're starting to utilize uh, into our protocol, into our, our health, um, to make sure that it's not going too far. There's a number of categories that we have to be cautious with. Doesn't mean it's contraindicated, but I would say be cautious. Things like blood pressure, blood sugar, uh, diuretics, uh, water pills, um, antidepressants, anti-anxiety and sleep medications. All of those do what they say sometimes. And if they're doing an okay job and we take an herb for that same purpose, we're going to see a multiplier effect that may cause some problems like we don't wake up again or our blood pressure drops too low, um, that we're peeing excessively. So important to be really careful um, and think about that. And I'm going to come back around and talk about that a little bit more um, at the end of all of this. The other thing, there's categories of medications called narrow therapeutic margin medications. These are things that are a little bit riskier, and I never recommend that anybody tries to uh, utilize herbs at the same time that they're doing these types of things. Narrow therapeutic margin medications are things that if you don't take enough, something really bad happens, and fairly quickly, and if you take too much, something really bad happens like death. And we try to avoid that, I, I understand. So things that are narrow therapeutic margins are things like chemotherapy for cancer, seizure medications, certain antivirals, not all of them, but certain ones of them, immunosuppressants, um, all of those really, oh, blood thinners, can't forget my blood thinners, all of those uh, and, and a few other more obscure medications the wrong amount of that medication really has dire circumstances. In this category, A, I always recommend you work with a practitioner. You really need an herbalist. If you're going through chemotherapy, uh, dealing with cancer, you know, it, it's one of the scariest things and the medications that they oftentimes recommend are really intense. And we reach out for things like uh, herbs and supplements uh, in order to alleviate some of those symptoms. The downside is a lot of what we read online is not designed or thought of to be working with those prescription medications, those IV uh, chemotherapies, and so forth. I'm going to say, nope, go find a specialist, somebody who specializes in that particular issue, um, and make sure that they really are a specialist with it. And I'll generically say, whenever we're working with narrow therapeutic margin medications, there's two categories of herbs that are vital that we don't work with. Things that are bitter and things that are sour. And that seems like an oversimplification, but the reality is those two flavors in concentrated forms, like herbs, 
are likely to change the absorption and excretion of those medications. So we would end up with the chemotherapy staying in the body for too long, potentially making us really sick. In you know something like sour herbs, keep things in the body. They astringe or tighten up and hold things in. In the same way, bitter makes us process it out too fast. And I, I'll tell you a really sad story. I had um, a woman came to see me. She'd already finished her chemo and radiation. And she was really proud to tell me, I'm just coming in just to see if you have any other suggestions. And I love it when people do that. Like they've done their own homework and they have a few questions. They want me to just look over blood work and things like that, which is great. Um, And she was so happy to say she went through her chemotherapy with zero side effects, no fatigue, no nausea, no vomiting. None of her blood values dropped. I was like, that's amazing. And like, were you working with somebody? She's like, no, I juiced through the entire thing. And so although juicing, we can argue its pros and cons and so forth, we'll save that for another episode. But the reality, what she did was she pushed out that medication so that it did no good. And all of it got flushed out of her body before it had a chance to really kill that cancer. So although she felt great, she got none of the benefits from going through that process of chemotherapy. And so I encouraged her to as quickly as possible go back to the doctor because six months from now, Uh, And and it turned out it lasted a whole year, but in a year the cancer came back. And it's because I don't think it did any good, the treatments that she did. So, you know, that's one of those scary things that we have to be very, very, very careful with, with that category of medications. Always find somebody who is well-trained and experienced working with those types of medications. And that doesn't mean that herbs shouldn't be an important aspect of working with any of those uh, scary, complex disorders. And I'll put one more caution on there. Um, St. John's wort. St. John's wort is a wonderful herb, and it's used for any number of things, anything from nerve dysfunction, and and I keep it purposely vague because it can be anything from neuropathy to uh, nerve injury uh, to frazzled nerves, you know, kind of how we use uh, in our day-to-day language. It is a great herb used internally and externally, If you're on zero prescription medications and zero over-the-counter medication, then it's a wonderful herb to use for kind of that uh, melancholia, the um, a a little bit of that Eeyore or grumpy uh, grumpy old man kind of stuff. St. John's wort's great for brightening the day. The flowers on it are this beautiful yellow color when we uh, mash it in our fingers. It, it comes out with this red, uh, oily substance that is one of the true uh, magical things about that specific species of uh, St. John's wort. But there's a downside. If you're ingesting St. John's wort, it will interfere with 50% of all prescription medications. And it may enhance its effectiveness or interfere with its ability to uh, do its job to include birth control. I hate to say it, one of my students and uh, an acupuncturist in our our area, uh, she was first learning about herbs before she ran off to school. She started taking, you know, she had a lot of stress in her life. She heard St. John's wort was good. She started taking it, and she was the most consistent, uh, you know, like nothing changed in her life. Her cycle was consistent. She was on birth control successfully for years and years and years, and she started taking St. John's wort, and she's got twins. Um, and those twins, she now has a tattoo of St. John's wort on her arm as a reminder that although this is a, a, a wonderful herb, it does have the potential to interfere. So please enjoy St. John's wort, but not if you're on anything prescription and nothing over the counter. Uh, uh, the one nice thing about St. John's wort, you can use it topically. It is one of my go-tos. I don't worry about herb-drug interactions when we're using topical uh, herbal uh, stuff. Um, so oil infusions and your oil infusion of St. John's wort should be reddish in color. Otherwise, it's not made correctly. Um, and it's my go-to for neuropathy or nerve pain or loss of feeling in the feet that can come from any number of causes, but it's really common uh, with diabetes. It's maybe not being controlled or maybe hasn't even been diagnosed yet. Some people are borderline, they get all the symptoms, they get the numbness and the heaviness in the feet, and they can go ahead and start applying that 
once or twice a day, you'll start to see some benefits usually in one or two months. There's a number of great companies out there making St. John's wort. Um, all right, we're going to do one more scary one. Um, you know, one of the challenges for both Western medicine as well as herbal medicine is dealing with serious uh, mental health issues. You know, emotional health, depression, I would say anxiety, usually pretty easy to address those any number of different ways. Um, but when we start to look at things like schizophrenia, uh, bipolar disorder, it becomes super challenging for everyone, whether you're, you're an MD, a psychiatrist, uh, or an herbalist. It's one of those areas that we don't see the great outcomes. That said, we do see some benefits. Um, in bipolar disorder in particular, uh, dietary changes can have a dramatic impact. Um, I haven't seen this in publication enough. It's kind of one of my students and myself kind of came up with this, that gluten um, has a dramatic impact on bipolar disorder. And there's different types of bipolar disorder. Uh, and I would say gluten has a dramatic impact on a range of mental health issues to the point where it's the difference between um, being successful and not is eliminating as much as humanly possible uh, any of the gluten-containing grains. Um, but there is a number of herbs that are now just kind of experientially we recognize as having a negative outcome when taking it with bipolar. And some of them are bipolar 1, some bipolar 2. Um, what I always say is like, if you're bipolar, don't take these. And they're ones that would be common for people to think might be beneficial. The one, the first one I ever learned was mimosa. And mimosa is a wonderful herb. It is used by Western herbalists. It's used by Chinese herbalists. I'm sure it's used in other communities. Uh, in Chinese, we know this is he huan pi or he huan hua. Uh, and uh, it's Albizia uh, Jurgens and um, mimosa, not a lovely drink in tropical shores, but actually this tree, um, is contraindicated with bipolar disorder. Its uh, Chinese translation is the tree of happiness. So it's one like, who doesn't want that? It grows throughout the eastern seaboard. I'm sure it grows elsewhere in the U.S. It's considered an invasive. Um, I love picking it fresh. Uh, usually people are very happy for me to come and uh, cut some bark off or harvest the flowers. I use that for people who are depressed. It can be used for uh, acute injuries, uh, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. It's literally wonderful, just not with bipolar disorder. Another one is rhodiola. This one comes from Siberia and Scandinavia. Um, sometimes it's called rose root. Uh, and it smells like roses, but tastes like crap. does not taste like roses. Roses are lovely to snack on, as long as they're not sprayed. Uh, so rhodiola is not only challenging to taste uh, or to drink because of its bitterness, it's contraindicated with bipolar disorder. Um, it's also drying. And that brings up an interesting concept uh, because... Think about it. We make all of these really dramatic claims about the success of herbs for this case or that case, but it doesn't work on everybody. Why doesn't it work right? And uh, rhodiola is one of many great examples for that. And I said it's drying. So, you know, we find some things are, we use moisturizers to the skin. We have things that dry the skin. So there's this concept in herbal medicine that is cross-cultural. Every traditional culture uses this concept of energetics. And if you listen to this podcast, if you've ever listened to me speak anywhere in the country, you know that I always end up going back to energetics. And I really push this concept for safety and effectiveness of herbs. So we say that herbs are hot and cold, wet and dry, nourishing or reducing, or tightening or relaxing. And the reality is we can describe every herb and every disease in these terms. We say that you have a fever, which we use a thermometer to measure that, but the reality is 
your mama or your grandmama used to just put their hand on your forehead and said, oh, you've got a fever. We need to give you something to reduce your fever. So you have a hot disease that needs to be reduced. And so we have herbs that do that. Um, and if your stress is, uh, and your depression, if your fatigue is caused by a wet condition where you're really phlegmy, then rhodiola is wonderful. But if you're thin, wiry, dry, tend towards constipation, dry skin, maybe anemic, and you take rhodiola, it will actually make you worse. It'll make you angry. It'll cause constipation. You'll go, I don't know why everybody says this about it. So making sure that you are figuring out the energetics of the herbs that you're taking, for that matter, again, another podcast is the energetics of prescription meds, because there are some. Everything has energetics. Um, and we can be predictive of adverse events with some of those medications if we look at their energetics. So not only do we need to know the energetics of the herbs and the individual we're giving it to, I would say even the, the animal, uh, two-legged or four-legged, it doesn't matter. But we also, herbalists tend to work in formulas or combinations of herbs blended specific for the individual. And so we can say, well, yeah, but I need this action of the rhodiola. We could add something like slippery elm or marshmallow or hibiscus to counteract some of that drying effect of the rhodiola. So it's just dependent on the skill of the practitioner. And so many people, uh, functional medicine docs, naturopaths, usually don't learn energetics. So they, they don't use that to choose the right herbs or combination of herbs. So I do digress. Um, the other one is valerian. That one seems to be less severe, but I will say that valerian can also interfere with uh, bipolar disorder. So mimosa, rhodiola, valerian, please, please, please use caution with those. So I want to talk about, because, you know, I'm sitting here talking about herbal safety. We're talking about all these things that we have to be careful about, and I don't want to instill fear. Uh, in 25 years, I rarely see an herb-drug interaction, and it's usually mild. But so often when we say herb-drug interactions, people get this very negative response. This is a bad thing. And I'm going to say, I want to change the way we perceive this idea, this idea of negative herb drug interactions is certainly a concern, but I want to talk about positive herb drug interactions. And I have so many examples of that. Some of you may be familiar. If you take an antibiotic, you should take a probiotic. I know that's not an herb, um, but that counteracts the risk of yeast infection and loose stools and all the digestive stuff that comes from antibiotics. And antibiotics save your life sometimes. You know, if I get appendicitis and it bursts, I want all the antibiotics. I'm not going to go look for some golden seal while I'm, I'm sitting there festering in my, uh, in my uh, abdomen. So when we think about herb drug interactions, when we talked about taking like for like, um, so if you're on high blood pressure meds, you take, and you take, uh, let's say, Hawthorne, uh, that will lower your blood pressure. So blood pressure meds are important. High blood pressure will cause damage, can cause a stroke, heart attack, things like that. So as we change behaviors, you may need a blood pressure medication. And all of those, you know, we've all seen the commercials where they rattle off how, you know, th this medication may cause death and dismemberment and bleeding out of every orifice and blah, blah, blah. Although those do happen, those are real, um, they usually don't happen at the lower dosing. We see those really severe, scary things happening at the higher dose range. So if we're able to take an herb and a drug that have the same function, Hawthorne and blood pressure medications is a great example. We can lower the amount of the prescription med to minimize the side effects. And so that's a positive herb drug interaction. The same is th true of blood sugar. If we're using a leaf of bitter melon three times a day, um, and we can take the lowest amount of metformin, or if you're already injecting insulin, maybe a little bit less in insulin, you'll really help to accentuate the positive benefits of those medications. And I'll tell a quick story about that. I had a, a woman uh, in her 90s, she came to me, she had no feeling in her feet, uh, neuropathy was bad. Um, she had emigrated from Cuba before Castro took over. So in Batista, she was like 18 years old. And I was doing acupuncture on her, and after three sessions, she was no improvement. And it was tough because she didn't speak any English, so she would have to bring her daughter or granddaughter in and translate for us. 
And um, I tried to give her herbs. She's like, I don't want your weird Chinese herbs. I was like, all right, you know, we'll keep doing acupuncture. And after three times, I, I said, you know, I don't think this is working. I don't think you're getting any benefit. She didn't want to discuss changing her diet. She liked her rice. She enjoyed her, her bread. She enjoyed her guava jelly and all the other yummy things that are part of Cuban culture. And, um, and so I think she was literally coming because she liked me rubbing her feet with St. John's wort oil, but you know, she wasn't doing anything other than that. It was not enough to, to fix, uh, what was going on. So then I asked her something that I ask a lot of folks. People who grew up in the city, they don't have a long history of herbal medicine. We, we become very modernized. We follow modern Western medicine. But people who lived in the countryside, in uh, other countries outside the U.S., there's oftentimes uh, a history and a lineage of herbal medicine. So I asked her, I was like, so when you were in Cuba, did you live in the city or the country? She's like, oh, the countryside. You know, this is all through a translator. And I was like, were you on the coast or are you in the mountains? She was like, oh, yeah, you know that there's mountains in Cuba. And was, she was like, I grew up in the mountains. And I was like, so did your mom ever give you herbal medicine? And she kind of looked at me. She was like, yeah, actually, my mother uh, was known as one of the healers in, in their village that they lived near. And that people from the village would come and get help. And, and she would put all these herbs together and make her drink these nasty herbs. So then I looked at her and I was like, if I gave you an herb that your mama would have given you from the mountain there, would you take it? Because it will help your blood sugar. And now she really looked at me like I had three heads. And I was like, how does this punk kid know anything about uh, the herbs in Cuba and so forth? And uh, so... Luckily, I noticed at that time that there was a lot of bitter melon, and the Caribbean bitter melon is very different from the Chinese bitter melon. So we use the leaf for that medicine. And uh, I went out into the alleyway, pulled some off a hedge, not a good place to harvest your medicine, but I wanted to teach her daughter and her what the medicine looked like. I was like, you see this plant? And her daughter got just thought it was hilarious. She just, I threw a huge trash can of this away. It was all over my yard. I was like, yeah, well, you might want to dig that out of the trash. You can use it dried or fresh. And I was like, I need you to eat three leaves a day. I don't care if you wrap it in bread and slather jelly on it. I need you to eat this. She came back about uh, six weeks later and you could see the feet that were about to be amputated probably very quickly. All of a sudden, we're starting to get more blood supply. So finding these herbs that can work and she was still taking her medication, but they weren't enough. That made her medications work better and really helped turn her around. Um, the other one I'm going to say is uh, about taking herbs with antibiotics. They make antibiotics work better and they help prevent resistance. One of the huge problems and maybe the demise uh, of humankind is our overuse of antibiotics is creating bacteria that is resistant. You know, we, we talk about MRSA. Now there's super MRSA. And not too long ago, we saw the first case in India of a bacterial infection on somebody who came to a hospital that nothing could fix. And so that's terrifying. So there's things like Andrographis pedicularis, uh, and dandelion and a number of other antimicrobial herbs that can be taken along with your antibiotics to improve the effectiveness of those antibiotics and prevent resistance. There's a whole longer thing about the efflux pump and uh, the, uh, the quorum and the biofilms about why this works that you can find volumes of research on PubMed looking specifically at herbal medicine with these antibiotics uh, to help defeat the defense mechanisms that bacteria have. So, you know, one of the things uh, I think is important is, you know, making sure that you're educating yourself, you're not looking at a single source for your information. So I always tell my students, look for three independent sources for any of the stuff I say. I say crazy stuff all the time. Um, but also investigate the training and the experience of anybody you work with. And I do think everyone should be working with an herbalist. There's certainly that home remedies, elderberry syrup and um, chamomile and ginger. These are very common things that are that uh, mother, grandmother level of herbalism that I think you know, is a lost thing. There, that's where everyone should have a little bit of herbal knowledge. Um, but as we start to look at some of those 
more serious diseases, those chronic diseases that we deal with, I hate to say, as we get older, um, that really needs a little bit more refined and educated eyes. So good starting place, that American Herbalist Guild, find one of their registered herbalists, that's somebody who they recognize as an herbalist. Um, but that's not the only way to find a good herbalist. And I was like, you know, one of the things, and I, w I promise I won't do this every time we, we do um, an episode, but I want to take a few minutes to talk about where's my information coming from? Did I just Google it like everybody else? So the reality, uh, I started studying herbal medicine when I was about 10 years old. Um, Mom sent me off to a summer camp in Maine, uh, Camp Winnico, uh, and I hated it. I was a city boy, born in Chicago, New York City at the time, Manhattan proper. And uh, the camp nurse said, come on, we're going to go for a nature hike. And I was like, fine, anything, I'm bored in the cabin. And as we went along, she was like, look, there's a wild blueberry, we can eat that. And the idea that I could pick a blueberry from a bush and eat it and it tasted good was such a novel concept. And from there, she was like, look, wild strawberries. And the next thing I know, I was eating the petals of a tiger lily. And so I was fascinated with this idea of that there was food. Uh, and as I turns out later, I understood also medicine that was literally growing everywhere, uh, even in New York City. So yay, I survived that. I went back to New York City. Back when we had things like libraries and card catalogs, I found uh, a book, uh, Ewell Gibbons, uh, who's passed away now, Stalking the Wild Asparagus. That was my first herbal book. Uh, and I started to find things like dandelion and burdock and all these other plants that were growing there in New York City and, and uh, John Jay Park and Carl Schurz Park and, and, of course, Central Park. I was out there wildcrafting herbs, not knowing anything that I was doing. Amazing I didn't kill myself. I uh, didn't even think about safe harvesting practices, probably dog pee on everything. And um, from there, I, I kind of, for some reason, really got into this survivalist thing. So I started studying a lot of the uh, survivalist books that always talked about these herbal medicine, not just the edible foods that were around us. M I, and I'm going to say my next teacher after that, you know, was my mama. Uh, so she was a medical writer and went from uh, medical books for the lay public, very mainstream medicine kind of things, like how to beat a bad back, and now that, you know, uh, now that you've had your baby, and orthotherapy after you've had knee surgeries. But then she was asked to write a book with Dr. Atkins, uh, Bob Atkins. And so she uh, thought, you know, he was a little loony, and ended up having some health issues. And she said, well, you know, Bob, if you can, you know, Bob Atkins, if you can fix my health issues, I'll write the book with you. And so she changed her diet, stopped eating the standard American diet, uh, and so she ended up writing that book with him. And so this was a shift not only in her writing that it moved to the alternative realm, but it also was a huge shift for me because now I started to look at, as I had to eat what she ate because mama was cooking, um, that we looked at uh, all the vitamins and minerals, the nutraceuticals and all the health products that were popular in that mid 70s and all of her books going forward about that. So I really learned a lot about vitamins and minerals. Um, you know, my running joke is JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association was our bathroom reading in my house. So I was inundated with it. And not to say mama pressured me, but I always knew that, you know, there was an expectation me, for me to be a doctor and run off to med school at some point. So fast forward a little bit, moved down to the Bahamas and ended up moving to the out islands of the Bahamas, uh, Abaco. And whilst I was down there, I did a lot of diving, uh, free diving for lobster and conch, things like that. And no boodle, uh, I ended up buying half ownership in a commercial fishing boat with him uh, by the age of 14. And I didn't know the term shaman at the time. Uh, this is pre-internet still. And so this idea of uh, you know, how do we figure this stuff out? And he, I didn't even appreciate it at the time. 14 years old, we're sitting on the, the beach, cracking conch. And he's like, you see that bush over there? And he would either talk about its food, its medicinal benefits, and even some of its spiritual benefits. So my Caribbean and Florida uh, herbal knowledge started with him. Uh, from there, uh, it was uh, a lot of my own research, every book I could find by every herbalist who published uh, it was uh, when I ran off to college, 
I uh, started as a biochem major, planned on going to med school, decided I hated college, um, ran off and uh, joined the army, uh, and there was two stints of that, but in the middle, uh, I spent about six months on a sailboat living off the land uh, in the Everglades, the west coast of Florida, and finally, boat sank in Key West, ended up back in the military in Europe, in Germany, uh, and enjoyed learning a lot of the plants that were uh, easy to find there in the woods. Uh, and ended up in the desert for Desert Storm Syndrome, excuse me, in uh, the Desert Storm, and learned some of the plants that were in the desert. There's all kinds of interesting things. Got out of the military and had Desert Storm Syndrome, and all of the herbal knowledge that I thought I had, all of it failed. I got sicker and sicker, went from workaholic to um, basically homebound, and somebody talked me into going to the local acupuncture school, and I'm terrified of needles. I know I'm an acupuncturist, it's weird. Um, I had a horrible first experience and I was suckered into going a second time. This time, the person took the time to explain to me that there was a system of understanding herbs outside the medical construct, this idea of energetics. And with that idea of energetics, they started to teach me about diet in a way different from the way all the Uh, pop culture books and so forth were talking about it. So here's a shocker. I got better primarily from the herbs. I really honestly couldn't handle the stress of getting acupuncture very often. Um, Really changed the way I consumed food and thought about food, used some cool techniques like moxibustion on a daily basis, um, and had the opportunity to run away to acupuncture school. And I went there to learn the energetics. And it was very quickly after I started school that I discovered the American Herbalist Guild and was awed that I got to sit and have a meal with all the books, the authors of the books that I had read in the past. So that sent me on the journey. I knew that I wanted to have an herb school. I wanted to have a clinical experience similar to what I had in acupuncture school. And I wanted to integrate the energetics with the Western and all the Caribbean medicine. Um, And I could go on for hours about that, about how those are there. It's just not always talked about in as concrete a way as that hot, cold, wet, dry, deficient, excess, tense, and lax. Um, so after I finished school, I um, really shortly thereafter created a Chinese herbal program that was focused on uh, clinical practice. And then about uh, eight years ago, started the uh, complete Western herbal program. Uh, again, all the way from beginner through clinician and lots of cool specialty classes, um, and now have a TV series in Ecuador, a 12-part TV series um, uh, that you, you can find out on the internet, and really just doing everything I can to integrate the different systems, to spread the importance of energetic medicine, uh, and to raise the bar for herbalists everywhere. No matter what your level is, whatever your experience and training is, I wanna make sure that we're safe, um, that we're effective, that we get a recognition of all of that. And so it's kind of become my life mission. So mom, that nurse who I, of course, don't know the name of, no boodle. And then in acupuncture school, I had so many teachers, Er Li, um, Hai He Tien, and many others. And David Winston, even though I've not done formal training with him, uh, I consider him one of my mentors and guides, and he's a fellow workaholic, so I will never achieve the insanity of his work schedule. Um, And so many other folks that I've studied with uh, short-term and long-term that have formed the unique person and herbalist that I am today. So... I hope that you've enjoyed your time with me with this new podcast, Mastering Herbalist with Bob Lindy of the Tradition School of Herbal Studies. This podcast, I'm trying to raise the bar for everyone, no matter what your experience level is, um, novice to practitioner, if you have an interest and excitement for herbalism, you should be listening to what I'm trying to explore here. You can learn more about the school of, uh, at traditionsherbschool.com. And I'm happy to say I'm going to start interviewing some other folks that I think have a lot of great information and safe information uh, to bring to the table that's 
really allowing you to take care of yourself. So our next episode, we'll be doing a deep dive on hormones with a focus on thyroid, which can be hyper or hypo. Everybody's a little different. It can be autoimmune. Um, so we're going to be talking with a uh, herbalist by the name of Trisha Perez. So be sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of the upcoming episodes. And be sure to send in any questions or folks you'd like to see on this podcast. Uh, and we'll be educating everybody as we go. Thanks so much.